on the South Bank show the story of the Velvet Underground which has been described as the most influential rock group of the 60s. They played together for only four years, 1966 to 1970, and made only four albums during that time. They never played outside America. But the Velvet Underground introduced a rough edge of street realism and doubt into pop music at a time when most bands were still caught up in West Coast flower power, especially poppy power. Without them, it's probably fair to say that punk wouldn't have happened. Their influence is acknowledged by people as diverse as David Bowie, Talking Heads, and the Young Jesus and Mary Chain. Seventeen years after they broke up, their songs are still widely recorded, and this week Polydor are re-releasing all their albums. The Velvet Underground were Lou Reed, a rock and roller from Long Island, avant-garde musician John Cale, guitarist Sterling Morrison, and a young, untrained drummer, Maureen Tucker. For a time, they were joined by the beautiful singer, Nico. Together they created the first alliance between pop music and the avant-garde. Perhaps it could only have happened in the 60s, when the emergence of pop art and underground cinema caused an explosion in the established art world. Maybe a big pop rather than a big bang, but impact it had. To reflect the mood of the time, we've illustrated the story of the Velvets with rare underground film from that period. The Velvet Underground were promoted by pop artist Andy Warhol in the mid-60s. Warhol was at the height of his celebrity then. To his New York studio, the factory, came art dealers, limousine liberals and downtown bohemians. Warhol's films of these people became as famous as his paintings, and he began to look for a new three-dimensional art form. The Svengali of fashion struck again. Pop art met art pop. We're sponsoring a new band. It's called the Velvet Underground. And, um, and we're trying to... When, since I don't really believe in painting anymore, I thought it would be a nice way of combining... Uh, and we have this chance to combine music and, and art and uh, uh, films all together. And, uh, and we're sort of working on that. And, and uh, well, the whole thing is being auditioned tomorrow at 9 o'clock. And if it works out, it might be very glamorous. clear that uh, the Warhol enterprises were going to be 
something on the order of, of a Hollywood studio. And the Hollywood studios need not only a lot of stars around uh, jockeying for position, but a big, a big uh, lot on, on which to, uh, to perform. And uh, it was perfectly natural if the art was being made there and the films were being made there for the music to come the same way. Everything that he touched, he had such facility of making it uh, a big success somehow. He turned everything into gold. Who did that picture? So much gold. Oh, you know, um, that's Hop Artist. What's his name? He makes avant-garde films, too. Oh, you mean him? I saw some of those films. Nothing happens in them. Well, people are just supposed to be themselves or something like that. Oh, there's one of his actors. Oh, he's in the thing I saw. The only good thing is, I think he should go to Hollywood. Are you kidding? He looks too far out. I mean, in a really big way, the crossover happened with the Velvet Underground and Andy uh, and the art world. So the band actually became more like an art band because of its association with Andy and because of Andy's association with the art world, as opposed to just another rock and roll band. Well, I was working at the factory with Andy. It was just about the time that the Velvets became associated with us. And I really got into the music and I started dancing in front of the group. Light on your door to show that you're home When you think the night has in your mind That inside you're twisted and unkind Let me stand to show that you are blind Please put down your hands Cause I see you The Vote Underground were a completely unknown group until they met Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, within the space of three months after meeting them, had them playing nightly at the dorm on St. Mark's Place to an extraordinary audience, a mixture of uptown socialites, downtown trash, junkies, factory people, society people, fashion editors, and everything. It was a, it was a new accumulation of people that hadn't been seen before. And they became famous. It's my life <laughs> because a man to my vein needs to a center in my head, and then I'm better off than dead. as a legacy, they were really precursors to a lot of what's happening today. They were really the pathfinders. They were the ones that were going to get take the ridicule, even. Uh, where, where what's happening now is a lot of that music is, is more or less accepted. It was an attempt to be revolutionary. An attempt to, to combine both the avant-garde and the, the commercial and try to make a run of it. at one point for a year and a half every day for a year and a half and um, recorded every, every rehearsal and um, 
I ended up uh, filing down the bridge of my viola and calling it a three-string th three drone and uh, so, and put guitar strings on it and it would and use the bass bow on it and it, 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 it would make a noise very similar to a B-52. And uh, together, the thing, when, when we really started uh, develop, uh, you know, performing it with, with some power, I mean, it would definitely have um, a daunting effect on the audience. I was interested in, in developing rock and roll in, in, a, in, a, in a sense that you would incorporate this, uh, both the funky side of rock and roll and the Wagnerian side of rock and roll and put it together. But Lou was living upstairs and heard us playing uh, all these blues records and whatnot. Um, at the wee hours of the morning, he had the campus radio show that was on once a week on Saturdays. So he came down to borrow records. And I could hear all this humming and buzzing upstairs. And that was Lou warming up. And then he was just playing uh, as loud as he could with his amplifier hanging out the window. Uh, I said, oh, he plays guitar too. I have to talk to this guy. And you know, so I did. ideas, three chords, turn it up, and make the lyrics be about something. It had to be about, about something that had to do with everyday reality as we knew it then, as opposed to just um, nothing or making believe it was about something. I mean, I think when the, a real characteristic of the Velvet Underground, as I, as I think is about my own, my own songs, is that they're really about something. I mean, that we really care about, that really happen, that have some bearing in real life, and they're not just uh, <laughs> a disposable subject. I mean, I was trying to, to give you a shot of some of the street. Standing on the corner, suitcase in my hand. Jackson's course, Jane is in her vest. And me, I'm in a rock and roll band. Huh. Riding in a studs, bear cat gym. You know, those were different times. Oh, all the poets, they studied rules of verse. And those ladies, they rolled their eyes. I'm the Jack, he is a banker And Jane, she is a clerk and There was the songwriter, Lou He was rapidly trying trying to f show me all these other songs But he was playing them on, a, on an acoustic guitar And I said I was really fed up with folk music and, um, the Dylan stuff and Joan Baez stuff I was, I was quite... Uh, Disinterested in people writing songs that had nothing but questions in them. That is far better, to, far better to make a statement than, you know, how many miles must I? And, and uh, but it, but but when I read the lyrics, they they certainly were not. I mean, the lyrics to heroin were certainly not uh, self pitying.
they're good songs. I mean, they're going to stand up no matter who plays them, but they're nothing like how we wound up playing. Me with my, my um, no drum training whatsoever, just bashing away made a, a huge difference. Sterling with his uh, nice, quiet little ideas of, of uh, guitar playing and his real solid um, rhythm playing, and John with his manic viola. <laughs> Lou would go off and, on a tangent, and Cale would go off on a tangent, and if someone wasn't holding, wasn't holding it all down, it would just be this massive confusion. So I would concentrate on just playing the same beat we started at and just keep it under there so when everybody came back, there was something to go back to. In 1965, the, the pop music scene, wherever it was going, was going to go without us. That was our conclusion. Um, John had no pop involvement whatsoever, and Lou and I had, had given up. It was impossible. Uh, the bands all had matching suits and little choreographed routines, and uh, it was Joey D, you know, that kind of thing. Jay and the Americans, I guess they were around. Uh, it was very cosmetic. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to welcome you here to the dance pavilion up at Lake Arrowhead. To really kick off this swing in summer, from Reprise Records, we bring to you Mr. Personality himself, Donnie Brooks. Hey! About a woman. I want to tell you about a woman that's crazy. I call her Penny the Pooh. She knows exactly what to do. She's a real cool dolly. She's a hot tub molly. So we said, well, we don't have matching suits. And it's unlikely that we can work out any of these dance routines. So I guess we're, we've had it. And um, that was it. So Lou John and I, having concluded that that we'd had it, um, we're then free to pursue any, anything we wanted. Until I took uh, took up acting lessons with Lee Strasberg and Marilyn Monroe was in my class. Very exciting. And he said I should join him uh, in in New York. And it was um, Bob Dylan that introduced me. And he also told uh, Andy that that he should make movies with me. I guess uh, he wanted to, to look at me through a magnifying glass. <laughs> and, you know, just uh, wherever he went, he had this. To me, it seemed that way, you know, when, when you always have a camera with you at, at all times. Um, his uh, sense of surveillance was uh, very acute. Accurate? Acute and accurate. Well, yeah. Acute. You know, he was a spy. He spied on everybody. Un voyeur. 
I mean, he just put disparate elements together, which is what, I, what I, I've always appreciated him for, because I thought that's the approach that, that I had to, towards the music, was that there was Nika, there was Lou, there was Sterling, no more, and you put four or five different uh, elements together, and you get a sixth. You had a very eclectic gathering of people from time to time at the factory. You had Andy, Andy's uh, gallery dealer, Leo Castelli, would come by with maybe one or two people. You had collectors that Andy knew. They came by on occasion. And always when somebody like that would come by, there would al always be another group of people there also, maybe a couple of amphetamine heads or, uh, uh, you know, people that didn't have a place to stay or... Um, Artists, other artists, or poets even. Um, maybe a fashion model or two on occasion. Parties, which is on the first record, which is Andy's favorite song, which is all about, well, it's all about this girl who's concerned because she doesn't know what sort of dress she should wear to go to the party tomorrow, and she hasn't got enough money to go and buy a new one, so she's got to borrow someone else's dress, you know, and so on. These are all like little specifically short stories about individual peoples, which, which uh, grouped together, create kind of a group portrait of a sensibility and of a lifestyle, in the same way that, that the film Chelsea Girls does exactly the same thing. I mean, Chelsea Girls basically is 12 different vignettes. What? Come down here to make... I... to make a movie? Come down here to... Oh, I hate movies. The underground is not my scene. Ah, uh, excuse me, I have a trick here, dear, that causes me a little bit of problem. Now, I'm here. Shut up! I... Oh. You're right. Life in the 60s was just totally different. Uh, everybody was taking speed. Everybody was drinking a lot. You know, nobody went to sleep at night. We used to stay up for eight and nine days without going to bed. I recorded for about eight years every moment of my life. I would come home and you know, three o'clock in the morning from Max's Kansas City, and I would sit there and listen to my whole day of tapes, writing zero to five, conversation with Andy about so-and-so. I would type this all up to put it in the cassette and then type it in books, and the really good, juicy tapes, I would transcribe the whole thing, just for my own personal um, use. And then I... Lou used to call me up. There was a period when Lou used to call me up all the time and sing to me over the telephone his new songs. I don't know just where I'm going. Cause it makes me feel like I'm a man When I put 
put a spike into my vein And I tell you things aren't quite the same When I'm rushing on my run And I feel just like Jesus' son And I guess that I just don't know And I guess that I just don't know I think it was like very unusual to have someone with a viola or a violin in a group and a girl drummer and um, and also the songs were very um, very radically different from your normal rock and roll love song. They dealt more with darkness and there wasn't anything optimistic about the songs in a sense. I think the effect of Venus and Furs is that uh, musically it's so shocking. Uh, I think that's what frightened people. That could have been a song about anything. But uh, that, that always has been my favorite song. That's the, if I had to say, show me one thing that you do differently than, than anybody else ever did, uh, I would drag out Venus and Furs. I'd say, you show me whoever sounded like this. Severin. Severin, speak so slightly. Severin, down on your bended knee. Taste the whip in love not given lightly. Taste the whip, now bleed for me. I think that was that was the the mood of anything is possible, uh, but let's find something beautiful. The, to me, the, the miraculous thing about the Velvet Underground was always not its uh, strangeness, not their uh, difference from what the current modes were, but in their own terms, a very beautiful sense of sound, of rhythm, and of melody. Sometimes I feel so happy. Sometimes I feel so sad Sometimes I feel so happy But mostly you just make me mad Baby, you just make me mad Linger on
you ever been to Love Inn? No. Oh, I think it's gonna be like Easter and Christmas and New Year's and your birthday all together, you know? If you're going to San Francisco day it was announced that we had enough money to go into the studio and we were going I said oh, okay uh, we just move our equipment in and start blasting and then when we had an album's worth of stuff that means stop you killed your European son you spit on those under 21 but now your blue cars are gone you better sit so long hey hey bye 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 I think we all had that idea to, to have a nice, uh, vaguely amateurish sound to this. I guess one of the things that affected the sound of the songs was that all the amps would be on at the same time, of course. And in those days, they weren't so great with, with baffling and hiding things. So there'd be feedback or uh, hissing and stuff that you really don't hear. But if that stuff was taken out, it would make a tremendous difference. You really had to let it sink in. Uh especially if you weren't especially taken with the sensationalistic negativism of songs like heroin uh, which I wasn't it sold what did it do it go to 99 in the billboard charts as it turned out it was prophetic but there was no way to know that at the time the most significant thing about that music was Maureen Tucker's beat and Lou Reed's uh, vocal manner quite remarkably deadpan and Underneath it all, witty, lively, full of its own kind of energy, too. Uh, he really understood at some level what that beat was all about and, and, and meshed with it perfectly. By the time the record came out, the initial energy which had gone into making it had kind of dispersed. The enormous Warhol uh, uh, production um, shows, the, the, the light show, the famous light shows, the Dom and the trip in LA, no longer existed. They just, it was all over. So this record was almost like a historical artifact by the time it came out. And Nico was no longer with the group. It was all... Then um, they got it together uh, with a new manager and with whom they had a pretty good relationship. And here you finally had the original Velvet Underground, Lou Reed, John Cale, Sterling Morrison, and Maureen Tucker. And they went into a recording studio in New York and recorded White Light, White Heat in the summer of 1967. For my money, I think it's it's the quintessential Road Underground record because it's the four of them, because it was it was produced they totally controlled it. Sister Ray is probably the best example of that. Sister Ray, it was a, which is a 17-minute long song, which of course is very, very unusual, particularly for those days, uh, was done in only one take. And the reason for that was that they just, uh, they were so fed up with each other and they knew it was a long song, and they knew they didn't, they didn't have it in them to do it more than once together in the same room. So they basically said, okay, this is it. Everyone do whatever the hell they want. We're gonna record Sister Ray. And if you listen to the track on a reasonably good uh, set of headphones or something, it's, it's quite fascinating because there, there really becomes a battle between the instruments in there. At one point, Kale turns his, his volume up on his organ extra high and starts bursting through this organ piece. And you can't hear the drums at all.
was probably at its peak at that period. And then there, there continued to be a certain amount of this tension between Kale and Reed. But as Sterling points out in my book, and as Maureen also said, it created, you know, the music. So then that went on for a while. And then there was the famous instant, instance in which Reed called a band meeting at the um, Riviera Cafe on around the corner from here on Sheridan Square. And Morrison and Tucker arrived, and John Cale wasn't there. And Lou Reed said, John's out of the band, and there was an enormous fight, and everyone started throwing things, and, you know. But, but basically, the, the, to, to jump to the third album, the third album was then made uh, without uh, John Cale. And now, this is where you get into kind of all sorts of uh, theories as to whether the Velvet Underground then became Lou Reed's backing band or not. I mean, Reed definitely has to be classed on the same level as, well, I mean, Bob Dylan, John Lennon, Chuck Berry, what have you. I mean, they, you know, some of these songs are, are immortal songs and they define a whole time period. Um, so I think that as, as a lyricist, as, as, a, as a poet, he's called the uh, uh, Poet Laureate of New York City. Well, the new... Lou Reed New York attitude is real. It's just the New York attitude. I, was, I mean, you know, you could find lots of people with it. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I mean, I can't really take credit for a new, copying on a New York attitude, but it was, it was like, there was no moral stance. I think that was another thing I tried to be really careful with. There's no moral stance to these songs. It was just, this happened and that happened, and it presented kind of dry, unemotionally. of rock poetry was a very important one when as usual Dylan was the uh, was the real exemplar no one ever thought about Lou Reed as a rock poet and in retrospect it seems to me that he had one of the most authentic and original voices of anyone writing lyrics in the 60s perhaps the most authentic and original voice and the reason nobody noticed is that there was nothing even remotely poetic in the appearance of his lyrics. They were very demotic, very conversational, very, to use a word I go back to again and again, deadpan. Now, um, in fact, he was capable of real flights of lyricism. I wish that I was born a thousand years ago And I Wish that I'd sail the darkened seas On a great big clipper ship Going from this land here to that Put on a sailor's suit and cap Away from the big 
big cities where a man cannot be free of all of the evil in this town and of himself and those around oh and i guess i just don't know oh and i guess that i just don't know lou was acting very oddly he told me he was leaving the group and he was really really upset and we sat there for a while i didn't put any questions to him or argue with him i just yeah had obviously made his decision um he didn't give me any specific reasons why he had was had decided to leave and that was that was the last night he played with them as i recall and maybe he played two more nights or something but we've all really gone our separate ways and uh i have no communication with any of them except maureen mo the drummer I'm not interested in them or high school reunions. And so I'm not interested in reunions at all. I, I, like, I like today, what's going on today. And I think it's nice what happened yesterday. I'm very proud of it all, but uh, I wouldn't want to go back. He's one of the best songwriters around today. His name's Lou Reed. It's one of his other things, it's Velvet Underground is as much the source of everything that's put under the vague rubric New Wave as the Beatles were of everything that was put under the vague rubric rock in the late 60s and early 70s. It's that is to say that bands which don't like the Velvet Underground, don't use any of their usages, still owe them a debt because they come out of the, of the, of the negative energy, the critical energy that that band instilled in, a, in the first generation of punk bands. I don't have any heroes. <laughs> They're all useless. I mean, distortion was definitely one of the things that we were interested in, in forcing down people's throats. I mean, it was just like wearing, wearing glasses on stage and, and turning our backs on the audience and just turning up loud and... And uh, as far as wearing glasses on stage is concerned, you know, the only reason we wore them was because we couldn't stand the side of the audience. It's almost an extension of the 1980s or an extension of the 1960s. I, I have to admit that. It's uh, as if the 70s didn't exist, as if it went straight from the 60s to the 80s, somehow. Well, I don't look back at those times at all. I, uh, I'm very much in the present. I, I, you know, when I pick up a magazine or a book and I see my name in it, I always think of that person as not me, but somebody else with that name. So it's like a character in a novel because I'm, I'm, I'm really into what I'm doing now in the present anyway. Oh. Warhol Studio. Jed? Hi, how are you? Good. Um, Fred's not, he's not in yet. Wait a minute, do you want to talk to Sam? This is a big office now. It's not really a factory. It's not 
crazy anymore. We don't have zombies coming around like we did in the 60s. Now we have Japanese businessmen. We have, uh, you know, collectors all day long. We have very chic luncheons upstairs, you know. And uh, it's all different, you know. It would be something that your mother would be very proud of. I had put out a little single, and that's when I found out what was going on as far as young fans and stuff. And then when I was selling my little single over the phone, I just, in my kitchen, calling up record shops around the country, um, I had my little speech all set. I was going to say, my name is Maureen Tucker, and I used to be in the Velvet Underground, figuring they wouldn't know who, the, who this was. And not one of them did I get to... Velvet Underground. As soon as I said Maureen Tucker, they knew who I was, and that really surprised me. I mean, all these people talk about, you know, how they, how they see the influence of this and that and that. You know, it's like the kiss of death, I mean, I would imagine. I mean, there's a cult following here for the Velvet Underground, and anybody would want to say, you know, to the record company, if they wanted to get signed, that they were influenced by the Velvet Underground would be, you know, would be stupid. I mean, it would be the last thing you would want a record company to feel was that we're dealing with another Velvet Underground. Images develop uh, in and of themselves. So once people decide that the Velvet Underground is in fact a depraved uh, group of junkies, uh, whatever their, their musical talents, then uh, people are always waiting for you to uh, do something strange. But in fact we had good table manners and uh, paid our hotel bills. Uh, didn't break furniture, uh, as people with uh, middle-class upbringings might be expected to do. Um, oh, if we'd done some insane things, it probably would have helped. We dress conservatively at the best of times Prefer the shadows to the bright lights in the eyes Of the ones we love the bright lights in the eyes of the ones you love what we see what we imagine the eyes tell us nothing the bright lights in the eyes of the ones you love will tell you nothing like the scars of imagination The scars of imagination The bright lights in the eyes of the ones you love Will tell you nothing Except you're the thoughtless kind So if you and the friends you make Never, never turn your back on them Say they were the best of times you ever had The best of times with the thoughtless kind The best of times with the thoughtless kind If you're not intent on, on succeeding at all costs, uh, you can't possibly sell out because there's nothing, uh, there's nothing to receive in exchange. So why not do anything you want to, uh, any way you want to? So we had a freedom that uh, most bands deny themselves because they're trying to make it. They're trying to do something. And we were trying to do something too, but we didn't care if it never got out the uh, four walls that we were in. Somebody shut the door. I knew where temptation lies inside of your heart. You can talk during this. I know where the evil lies Inside of your heart Well, get out of here If you're gonna try to make it right You're surely gonna end up wrong Wrong, 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 wrong Oh, 
shut the door. Ah! And it's only quarter to nine. I know. I know where the mirror's edge <laughs> is inside of your heart. But she didn't pay a dollar for me. <laughs> I know where the razor's edge is inside of your heart. Motown. It's not even five feet. Well, if you're gonna make it right, you're surely gonna end up wrong. You don't look like Marvin the Vandella. Oh, she's gonna start it all over again. Somebody get her out of here. Electricity comes from other planets. It's not that bad a solo. Four times. Oh! It's pretty together. You can't stay here. You can stay yes, here. I can. I can talk to myself as well. Lies inside of your heart. This is it. I know where the evil lies inside of your heart. Is you ready? But if you're gonna try to make it right, you're surely gonna end up wrong. <laughs> 